Hello and welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Amber Osman. In today's episode, county emergency officials along with response agencies participated in a tabletop exercise to practice and prepare for an upcoming large-scale drill. Local cyclists came out to celebrate the newest section of the East Central Regional Rail Trail. And the October passenger numbers are in for the Daytona Beach International Airport. In Volusia Here and Now, Kendra Lee visits the newly reopened West Wing of the Museum of Arts and Sciences. In Community Health Matters, Stephanie Strong takes us on a power walk to continue the fight against breast cancer. And finally, joining Community Information Director Dave Byron in the studio is Dave Griffiths with the University of Florida Volusia County Extension. Those segments, news and more coming right up on Volusia Magazine. Stay tuned. Preparedness and practice are the keys to a successful response to a large-scale disaster that requires a coordinated interagency effort. Daytona Beach International Airport recently tuned up for its Federal Aviation Administration required full-scale mass casualty exercise that will be held next March at the airport. Under the auspices of Volusia County Emergency Management, Personnel from the airport and other response agencies gathered at the county's emergency operations center for a half-day tabletop exercise that required critical thinking and simulated response decisions. The tabletop was a preparation for the large-scale emergency response drill that airports like Daytona Beach International Airport must undergo at least every three years. The mass casualty drill requires months of intensive planning. Nearly 100 emergency responders and other agency personnel participated in the tabletop drill that focused on an air disaster. The last full-scale drill at Daytona Beach International Airport was in March of 2013. The drills are designed to come as close as possible to a real disaster. To satisfy FAA requirements, all airport emergency plan functions must be exercised to assess the capabilities of the plan and responding personnel. In addition, response teams must coordinate with federal, state, and local agencies and activate the airport's emergency operations center. A mass casualty drill mocks various emergencies that can occur on a plane, ranging from crashes to knowing how to help injured passengers. Really getting all of the agencies in one room um, to discuss how they're going to approach a, an emergency was was a, a, a goal and an objective of ours in and of itself. Um, getting everyone to communicate with each other, getting everyone on board with the airport's emergency plan, and how we would all interact in the event of a large scale emergency uh, of that sort was, was, um, was really rewarding, was really good to see. The full-scale drill in March will include a plane fuselage and dozens of volunteers who will play the role of victims at the exercise location. More than 100 people celebrated the opening of the newest segment of the East Central Regional Rail Trail. The paved segment crosses 3.7 miles of natural wooded areas as it makes its way from Rotary Park to the pedestrian overpass on State Road 442 in Edgewater. Volusia County developed this segment with a $1.6 million federal grant through the Florida Department of Transportation. Edgewater Mayor Mike Ignisiak welcomed the enthusiastic crowd at Rotary Park. This is probably the most used trail that has not opened up in Edgewater. <laughs> it's been used by joggers, dog walkers, bikers, skateboarders, rollerbladers, and about anything else you can think of since they started laying the asphalt down. Everything in there is first class. The benches, the receptacles, the fencing on the side. Uh, it's a place where you can bring families out, you can bring your kids out, you can ride safely up and down without fear of traffic, without fear of any other problems. Volusia County Council member Deborah Dennys, who represents Southeast Volusia, shared her excitement about the trail segment and the partnership between Volusia County and the city. Fifteen years ago, Park Avenue, a guy in a bike, my husband almost lost his life because there was no bike paths 
and he ended up in ICU for two weeks at Halifax. So if you don't, and thanks to Edgewater's fire group, you guys were the first on the scene for transport. Thank you for that. <laughs> Paramedics, thank you. Longtime trail supporter Pat Northey joined Denny's, Ignisiak, and other officials for the ribbon cutting. Afterwards, scores of cyclists hit the trail for a community bike ride. The East Central Regional Rail Trail is being constructed along the longest abandoned rail line ever purchased in Florida. The state purchased the corridor from the Florida East Coast Railway and then it turned it over to Volusia and Brevard counties for the development and maintenance. Great day for the trails in Volusia County and the city of Edgewater and all of Volusia and pretty soon the state of Florida with this great ribbon cutting for our trails here uh, in Edgewater. This was a great collaboration with the city of Edgewater and the county in putting this trail together. And what's exciting is the outpouring of support. I would, there was just hundreds of people here today, people on bikes too, they've just left to ride the trail. Uh, and we announced, of course, to the general public our trails app, which we're very excited. And past county council member Pat Northey was here uh, to help celebrate and to honor her for what she has done through the years. Another big project that we're announcing is Volusia County's partnership with the city of New Smyrna and the city of Edgewater to put a trailhead at the Marine Discovery Center in New Smyrna Beach and, and connect all of this all the way to the beach for Volusia County and the state of Florida. It's a great day for all of us. When complete, the rail trail will cover 52 miles stretching from Deltona to Edgewater with a 10-mile leg through Brevard County to Titusville. In addition to the new Edgewater segment, Volusia County has completed rail trail segments in Deltona, Enterprise, and in Osteen. Additional segments are in the planning and development stages. The entire Volusia County section of the rail trail is expected to be complete in 2020. Passenger traffic at Daytona Beach International Airport increased 5% in October. During the month, 49,527 passengers flew in or out of the county-operated airport. That's compared to 47,075 passengers last October. For the 12 months ending October 31st, passenger traffic at Daytona Beach International Airport is down less than 1% from 628 240 passengers last year compared to 624 746 passengers this year. The average passenger load factor for October was the highest of the year, 97% for Delta Airlines and American Airlines combined. During October, the amount of seats offered by the airlines to Daytona Beach International Airport increased 7%, which is related to larger aircraft. We're very encouraged to see the traffic increase, and we expect the same to continue in November, December, and into January with the addition of JetBlue. The airport is well prepared for the upcoming holiday season. Um, we have TSA PreCheck now available at the airport, which is pretty exciting. So that's going to make your experience here at Daytona Beach International Airport even more convenient. For more information, you can contact Jay Cassens, Director of Business Development at 386-248-8030. You can also go online to flydaytonafirst.com. The Museum of Arts and Sciences has reopened their West Wing that was closed since 2009 with a new modern architectural flair. Here and now reporter Kendra Lee takes us on a tour of the Wing's galleries. With the recent expansion to the Museum of Arts and Sciences, Seen in the C.C. and Hyatt Brown Museum of Art, the museum ramped up efforts in a restoration project. With the help of a FEMA grant that matched a previously provided Volusia County Echo Grant, the museum was able to totally demolish and rebuild the original West Wing. The West Wing is the oldest part of the museum. This is what was first here when the museum moved over to this site back in 1971. The West Wing unfortunately flooded in May 2009 and was never the same again. So the museum really had to go on a, uh, a project to get it flood proof and we took the chance to, uh, the opportunity then to uh, really remodel it and make it more modern and make it much more modern space. The 1970s wing has been replaced with a complementary style 
that is open and enticing to gallery patrons. The white walls contrast the black ceilings and the dark flooring while creating a shimmering effect from the overhead lights within each gallery. When we designed this building, we were designing it all the time uh, at the same time as the C.C. and Hyatt Brown Museum of Art. The Brown Museum is lots of earth colours, lots of natural colours, lots of straight lines, lots of wood finishes. The designers of this building, the architects, wanted to give this a more modern contemporary feel. So it's lots of monochromes, it's lots of rounded corners, there are no sharp edges to any of the walls in here. It was designed to be a much more contemporary space to show a very different type of art to that, that which we have over in the Brown Museum. Now open, the West Wing features galleries ranging from 768 to 1,824 square feet. The main gallery is accessible directly from the lobby at the main museum entrance and expands into five other eclectic gallery rooms. Now this wing is, a lot of the galleries were the ones that were here originally, so we have the Cuban Museum, which is a real favorite, the largest collection of Cuban art outside of Cuba, uh, that's been a real, uh, real favorite with visitors. We also have the Thurman and Elaine Gillespie Gallery coming back in, which shows our African collections. That's a great collection of African art, masks, uh, objects from, uh, from Africa. Uh, we have the Mazzullo collection, which is a real favorite with families. Uh, that is a lot of uh, early European uh, weaponry, knives, swords, crossbows, but we're showing them with a lot of artwork now so you can see how they look when people use them and wore them. A lot of it's very decorative. We have the Carjan Center for Graphic Art, which currently houses a temporary exhibit that is the private collection of a photographer, Jack Mitchell, and his partner, Robert Pavlik, who were very influential in the New York art scene in the 60s and 70s. Jack Mitchell was the local guy who was a photographer who photographed John Lennon, his final portrait before he died. Um, and their art collection they donated to the museum, so we're showing that here. As you can see here, we have the diorama of the giant brown sloth from the original West Wing. And the prehistory of Florida gallery is the new home to the giant brown sloth skeleton. We built a whole new, uh, whole new room for it that is just fantastic. The sloth was moved back in there and it's got a couple of friends living there with it now. It's got the glyptodont and it's got the mastodont that was also found in Daytona. There's bones that are available to be shown of that are in there now. So we have a whole new Florida prehistory gallery opening. The West Wing is now open seven days a week with a general museum admission. For more information, visit the museum's website, moas.org. For Volusia Here and Now, I'm Kendra Lee. Breast cancer is the second most common cancer among women in the United States. But millions of women are surviving the disease thanks in part to early detection and improvements in treatment. Reporter Stephanie Strong takes us to a Pink Power program at the Florida Department of Health in Volusia County in this segment of Community Health Matters. This is such an exciting moment and an honor to be speaking because I am a survivor and it's a miracle to everybody today. The best thing I can say is it can happen at any age. I was only 39 when I found mine. My advice to all ladies, women, young, young adults is to watch yourself. If you see any changes, go to a doctor. Go to somebody you can speak to and go from that point. Breast cancer is very near to my heart. Uh, breast, breast cancer has affected me directly in many, many, many ways. I can say early detection has been my saving grace. Breast cancer is the most common cancer among women in the United States other than skin cancer. The Florida Department of Health in Volusia County hosted a Pink Power Walk and program to raise awareness to breast cancer. Millions of women are surviving with the disease thanks in part to early detection and improvement in treatment. Our health department here in Volusia County has a Florida Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. This program provides free pap smears and mammograms for eligible women who are not insured. So far this year, they have been able to service 245 women in the counties that they serve. Let's give that a hand. We are losing people to cancer every single year. But the best news is that lives are being saved even faster than we're losing them now. Our mission is to make cancer 
a preventable and a treatable disease. So as you heard these beautiful ladies come up here and say, early detection is your key. Knowing your body is your, is your savior. Several fire departments decorated their trucks pink to raise awareness to breast cancer. We want to make sure that we participated in as many events as we possibly can to uh, bring awareness of bre breast cancer to the community. So as you can see, uh, the city of New Smyrna Beach and uh, our um, firefighters uh, wrapped the truck in pink to bring awareness. We, we take the truck uh, wherever we, we're invited to, uh, to just let everybody just kind of bring awareness to what's going on. and and try to help raise funds as, as best we can. We are all survivors of breast cancer. Breast cancer has affected my family. I can say I'm a daughter of a survivor. I'm a sister of a survivor. I'm a niece of a survivor. I'm a cousin of a survivor and a coworker of many survivors. And I would say we will not let this disease or the big C bring us down today. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Stephanie Strong, Public Information Officer for the Florida Department of Health in Volusia County. Well, now it's time to head into the studio with the Director of Community Information, Dave Byron, and his guest, Dave Griffiths, the Director of the University of Florida Volusia County Cooperative Extension Services. Well, thanks, Amber, and hi, everyone. You know, when we think about Volusia County's economy, many of us tend to focus on tourism, construction, consumer services or healthcare, but another very significant factor in Volusia County's economy is the agriculture industry, which contributes more than three quarters of a billion dollars a year to the county's economy. With the annual Farm City Tour right around the corner, we thought this would be a good time to find out how our local growers are doing these days. Our guest in the studio was David Griffiths. He's the director of the University of Florida Volusia County Cooperative Extension Service. Dave, how you doing? Pleasure to be here today. Thanks very much. Happy fall to you. Yes, our, for our 34th year of coming down and talking to you guys and all about the farm tour. Seems hard to believe, Dave. We haven't gotten a single day older in 34 years. Huh? No, I think my hair's turned a little bit grayer and uh, <laughs> that's about it. Hey, Dave, uh, let's, let's talk uh, in general terms. Uh, as you look across the landscape in Volusia County, uh, how, are growers, how are our growers doing these days? Are they doing all right? Well, since last year we talked, uh, agriculture took a pretty big hit throughout this, uh, the county. We're down about 3,000 acres of total, which is, you know, in, in the broad sense, not a great concern, but, uh, you know, an average size farm, we're hanging in there, but we're just down a little bit from last year. Why, why so, David? Why the decline? Uh, the economy on the agricultural side and also the benefits of the economy on the real estate side. Real estate side has picked up a little bit, so we've lost some, some of our lands. Uh, from converted from agricultural to right. residential. So that's a good thing on the economic side. Right. Dave, uh, for those folks that are not familiar with kind of the uh, portrait of uh, Volusia County's ag industry, give us kind of a general description of ag in Volusia County. Well, ag in the county has always been the, 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 the primary product is cut foliage, brings in about $75 million a year to cut the economy. Cut foliage meaning firm, Cut foliage, right? ferns, floral arrangements, uh, greenery, that type of thing. Right. So cut foliage in general is our largest uh, economic engine. Uh, then we've got citrus, which we've done about 1,200 acres in citrus. And of course, citrus, we have the citrus greening, which uh, hopefully most people have heard about. Devastating disease in citrus. Right. Still currently, there is no cure for that. Right. So we're down to about 1,200 acres in citrus. We've got timber, pasture, cattle, livestock wow. are, are basically. And also we add the, being a coastal county, we also have, uh, aquaculture and the marine. David, uh, across the United States, uh, you know, it seems like uh, there are a lot of threats to agriculture. I mean, whether it be development pressure or whether it be droughts or, or uh, excessive rainfall or uh, overseas competition or whatever, it's uh, tough for the American farmer out there these days, I would think. Yes, it is. And one of our primary concerns in the state of Florida is uh, finding workers, finding workers that will do agricultural work. Right. Uh, the immigration laws and things that are out there, we need to take a look at that, and the politicians need to take a look at that, because it's very, very difficult for our growers to find people that will actually come out and do the work. Interesting. You know, you mentioned uh, citrus greening, and I wanted to touch on that for a second, because every year when you and I talk, it seems as though there's something, some new peril. 
Uh, anything new on that negative horizon, Dave? Yeah, well, sadly, every year there is something that comes up. And uh, here again, like I said, this is, citrus greening is still a, a current problem for us and devastating for both the commercial as well as the homeowner that has citrus trees in their yard. So that's a, a big thing caused by a citrus psyllid, which is like a tiny fly. Uh, so we're, we're working with that, trying to deal with that. And then uh, recently, about uh, two months ago, we uh, came up with something new called creeping indigo. Creeping indigo is a very, very small plant that you'll find at roadsides, pastures, you name it. It's, it's about everywhere. Wow. And creeping indigo uh, kills horses. Really? Kills horses. They love it. They will eat that over alfalfa hay. And uh, it's, there is no cure for them right now. And they love it. And we're finding it everywhere. Not only does it kill horses, but it can, it can, it can hurt sheep and other forms of livestock and cattle as, as well. Is there, is there something you can do to kill the uh, weed? I guess well, it's you a can, weed. Yeah, you can kill the weed, but it's uh, like a lot of things that are invasive plants, they have various things that will allow them to be invasive to make yeah. them very, very difficult to control. Wow. And this one does the same thing. And so it produces a phenomenal seed bank, and that seed bank can lie dormant in the soil for a long, long time. So wow. yes, we can kill the plant, but the seed bank is already out there. Oh, wow. Well, that's not good news. Not good news. Not, if you have a horse or livestock, you may need to be checking your pastures looking for this creeping indigo. Wow. Dave, let's uh, get positive here. Let's, not, let's <laughs> get off the negative here. One of the, one of the things that I was thinking about that's got to be positive for the American farmer today and you know, farmers in Volusia County is the fact that more and more every day we're talking about the value of eating healthy foods and we're talking about this con concept of a farm to table right. where restaurants and so forth are trying to serve locally produced produce and that sort of thing i gotta think that that's got to be a boost we have we're very fortunate to have several farmers in this county that produce food for the farm to table and farm to restaurants uh, we have some local restaurants that are buying a lot of their produce from local uh, vendors here so it's great so that is a movement. It's a national movement. Uh, the local vor type of movement, try to buy everything you can within 100 miles. We want people when they go to markets, when they go to the grocery store, make sure you check that country of origin. Try to buy U.S. products right. wherever possible. Dave, we've talked about the fact that, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, growers have to do these days is if they've got uh, acreage out there, they've got to maximize the value of that acreage is it turn is it uh, in in terms of production being able to generate revenue uh, our folks out there i guess have been pretty good at that any new crops uh, in volusia county that uh, sh show some uh, promise to us well we're still working on the olives uh, we still have one of the largest olive producers in the state uh, they were able to produce some oil this year uh, which is basically ahead of schedule what they were planning on wow so they were able to produce some very nice quality oil uh, there's some other people looking to do some pomegranates, wow. which is also another Mediterranean type crop. Peaches, we have some varieties of peaches. So there's also some alternative things that people are looking at, not to take over citrus, but to kind of help keep people in agriculture sure. until we can find a cure for citrus greening. Wow. Dave, uh, obviously anyone in business today has got to keep up with the business trends. Uh, you know, everything is so computerized. Internet sales are a big thing these days. Uh, you know, our growers today, I guess, in order to, to be uh, successful, have got to be uh, computer tech oriented and they got to be selling their products online, I'm thinking. They've got to be. And uh, one product that we don't really think of is uh, we, one of our places on our farm tour this year is uh, Bonsai's. And I was on their website today and they sell Bonsai's on the internet like crazy. Um, wow. Uh, also, we have some people that grow some products, some foliage down around. Uh, Lake Monroe, 99% of their sales is on the internet. Wow. Dave, uh, you know, uh, competition uh, from uh, foreign uh, companies is, a, is, is a, a challenge, I guess, for our local folks. But at the same time, international trade represents uh, new markets, uh, positive uh, economic developments. How are we doing in terms of uh, exporting in Volusia County? Well, a lot, a lot of our cut foliage goes overseas. And it goes into Europe, into Holland, uh, to the European market. Wow. So a great deal of our cut foliage does continue to go overseas. It also goes up to the Northeast. Wow. And the same with a lot of our fisheries, our, our, our aquaculture that we produce offshore here, 
a lot of that goes to the Northeast market because there's a better price for the Northeast market than there is in Florida. Wow. And so for folks out there that don't know about the uh, Cooperative Extension Service and that tie-in with local communities, give us kind of a general description. Sure. We're a, uh, an extension of the University of Florida. And back 100 years ago, some very smart people realized that the majority of the people could not afford to go to a university, but they still had problems and issues and concerns out in the community. So the Extension Service provided to take from the land-grant university, take the research out into the community to those that needed it, and vice versa. The problems out of the community would go back into the university to solve those problems. So we, we are an extension of the University of Florida, which is a land-grant university in this state. So you're basically educators. We are considered off-campus faculty of the University of Florida. A lot. Tell, tell us the variety of services or programs that you provide out there. Right. In Volusia County, obviously, with about 500,000 people, we have a lot of urban issues, a lot of urban concerns that we deal with. Uh, we have two family consumer science agents that deal basically with nutrition, education, and the home, home purchases. Uh, so that's the old home economics person. Right. Uh, a great deal of their time is spent educating people on nutrition and how to purchase a home and things along Managing those lines. Their finances. How to manage the home. We have an urban horticulturist that deals with the urban landscape situations around urban landscapes. That urban landscape includes homes, residential, commercial buildings, whatever. Uh, dealing with those landscapes. We have a livestock agent. She deals with livestock, timber, and pasture issues as well. And then we have a commercial horticulturist. She deals with the commercial side, the cut foliage industry, the citrus industry, the olives, golf courses. Some people don't think about golf courses, but that is a product. It's just like a, a beautiful, nice pasture, sure. another way. So, and a great 4-H program you've got. And we have there. a great 4-H program. We have a 4-H agent, and then we have uh, that deals with youth development. Uh, and all those master gardeners that uh, know just about everything there is to know about growing things in Florida. Right. We would not be able to continue to do what we do out of our office without our, ma our volunteers. We have well over 200 volunteers at our office that we are trained. And of course, uh, this is the time of the year when uh, Volusia County's ag industry is showcased through the annual Farm City Tour. Uh, sure. I know you've been, with all, been uh, involved with that right from the get-go. Give us a a quick overview of what it, what it is and then what's in store this year. Okay, this year's tour is on November 20th. The farm tour is always the Friday before Thanksgiving. This is our 34th year of celebrating. This is in terms of National Farm City Week. So it's a great time to go out, talk to, visit local farms. We've got 10 stops on the tour this year. It is a self-guided tour, so you need to make sure you pick up a map go to the designated times to the specific location and there will be someone there talking to you about their operation. But remember it's self-guided, tour is free, pick up your map, give us a call at our office, we'll be happy to help you out. So David, uh, again the date for the uh, tour is when? It'll be Friday, November 20th, always the Friday before Thanksgiving. We get started about 9 o'clock in the morning and go to about 3 or 4 in the afternoon. And for people that want more information, how do they get more information? They can go to volusia.org, go to our site extension office, and it's also on the front page on the banner of the volusia.org website. Well, David, I want to thank you very much uh, for sharing the information with us. Uh, a great uh, opportunity for folks to get out and enjoy the uh, beautiful rural side of Volusia County and meet some of our uh, agriculturalists. So thanks for sharing the information with it's us. It's always a pleasure, Dave. Thank you very much. Our guest today, David Griffiths, is the Executive Director of the Volusia County University of Florida Cooperative Extension Service. And with that, Amber, we'll go back to you. Thanks, Dave, and thank you for watching Volusia Magazine. If you have any questions about the show, you can always feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here, or you can log on to volusia.org and click on the News tab at the top of the screen to find us. Incidentally, you can find the County Council's meeting calendar there, too. In fact, you can use volusia.org to find out about meeting dates, workshops, topics of interest, activities, and how you can become involved. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio broadcast. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Amber Osmond. Have a wonderful evening.